All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Novan sponsored webinar, Advances in Understanding and Managing Molluscum in Children. I am Jen Dawson, Feeders Associate Director of Educational Programs. And I would just like to upfront say thank you to Novan for sponsoring this webinar and bringing this to PEDRA. This is chock full of great information. Um, briefly introducing our speakers tonight, Dr. Nanette Silverberg, who is clinical professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, chief of pediatric dermatology at Mount Sinai Health System and director of pediatric and adolescent dermatology. She is also the co-chair for Pedra Skin of Color and Pigmentary Disorders, our research-focused study group. And our second speaker tonight is Dr. Adelaide Hiber. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, professor of dermatology and pediatrics at UT Health McGovern Medical School in Houston. And she has been, just like Dr. Silverberg, immensely involved in the development of PEDRA. And she served on many committees in the past and was one of the first people I met in PEDRA while she was serving on the membership committee. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Silverberg, over to you. Okay, great. So we're going to start with an overview of molluscum. Um, so I call this the lowdown on molluscum. <laughs> uh, these are my disclosures, and they're not really relevant to this talk. Um, I did uh, uh, at some point uh, consult for Novan, uh, but not recently. Um, okay, so um, I like to say molluscum is the scourge of and you can fill in your own city because molluscum affects children in everywhere in the world. Uh, and um, it seems like no matter where I've practiced and where, where I visited, molluscum has always been an issue for uh, children and families uh, across uh, the US and across the world. Um, molluscum is a pox virus. So it's in that family of DNA pox viruses like smallpox, but it can't go any place but the skin. It is a double-stranded brick shaped. Uh, so molluscum is a pox virus again, uh, and um, it's only skin deep. It can't go any deeper. Uh, it has bimodal peak of occurrence. We see toddlers and preschoolers, and it seems like every year it gets a little bit younger. Um, and then we also see these school age children, um, especially a peak in like third grade, so eight, eight year olds. Uh, and then finally, um, there's this kind of steady state occurrence through childhood into adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, and that's some when, when we start to see the shift from MCV1 to MCV2. And if, there are some other variants of MCVs in other countries, uh, but MCV1 and 2 are the primary in the U.S. It is contagious when wet. 64% uh, of kids uh, describe swimming before the onset of, of the molluscum or parents. Two-thirds report co-bathing. And daycare attendance, uh, particularly we see kids in that younger age group with a potty distribution. So around the the tush, the butt cheeks, uh, and the popliteal regions. Uh, and then, of course, we have this issue in, in small kids that when people have larger households, they kind of line kids up and they share the towels and they, you know, go from child to child. And share towels and bath equipment has also been uh, demonstrated in households to be a, a source of uh, molluscum. And that can include even parents who share. Uh, so we've had parents who shared at the beach and caught from their children. Locations are, are very different from child to child. Uh, most toddlers get that, again, leg popliteal, so that uh, potty distribution. School-age children get that distribution in the axilla and trunk that comes from lifting yourself up in a pool, uh, being exposed on pool surfaces or roughhousing with friends. Uh, and then we have a lot of kids who have triggering of eczema. And that triggering of eczema is often noted in areas that are tendon, uh, have tendency to eczema. So that's popliteal region and antecubital region. And those particular regions have been associated both with onset of eczema and also flaring of eczema. And we'll see kids scratching intensely in these regions naturally because they are a topic. Uh, and that will, of course, uh, allow them to spread the molluscum as they get viral particles under the skin. Um, we can also see molluscum on mucosal surfaces conjunctiva, 
uh, can lead to conjunctivitis. Uh, you can get oral mucosal lesions. So certainly can see broadly, um, you know, despite the volume of molluscum that, uh, that I've seen in a, in a daily practice, um, we so rarely see oral mucosal lesions, but conjunctival lesions do occur, uh, again, fair, fairly uncommon, but because there's such a large volume of kids in the U.S. with molluscum, um, these lesions can be seen in our practices. So the morphologies vary from child to child, and it's always interesting to see, but there is some delineation by age and by location. So smaller, you know, we always describe molluscum as pearly papules with a central del. Um, but the DEL isn't always visible in the smallest children. So a child who has molluscum on the face, who's under the age of two, often has milia-like lesions, and you may not see the central opening. Um, because it's under a millimeter, sometimes uh, the whole lesion is under a millimeter. And so the central opening is too small to see with, with our tools. Um, eyelids, not just pediatric location, um, you know, we can also see, you know, uh, we can see that even in adults, um, there have been descriptions. Uh, and then we have these variants uh, that are seen, um, and they are important variants because some of them will mimic other things. So there's uh, the umbilicated nodular lesions, and those can uh, mimic um, in the intergluteal area, they'll mimic uh, condyloma. These big giant lesions on the feet can look like uh, tumors. Um, we can see conglomerated lesions and they can look like acne, um, you know, or they can look like uh, other growths, uh, erythematous lesions. Sometimes because of the inflammation, uh, we may not recognize that it, it's a molluscum lesion um, and they can get certainly inflamed and pedunculated. So molluscum is a great mimicker in dermatology. It can mimic inflammatory skin conditions, dermatitis, id reactions, erythema multiforme like molluscum uh, reactions can be seen. Um, it can look like acne amelia. Uh, on the eyelids, it'll give you cysts uh, and hordeolum type lesions. We can see cysts in other parts of the body. Again, very superficial, but they are can get rather large. Uh, infections um, that they can mimic include invasive fungal infections, virtually all the, uh, all the types of infections. So viral, uh, uh, bacterial, uh, can look like condyloma, it can look like warts, it can look like viral exanthems, particularly when you have axillary uh, molluscum and there's a dermatitis associated. Uh, it can uh, almost look like um, unilateral lateral thoracic exanthem. Of course, I mean, if you take out your dermatoscope, a lot of times you can see the molluscum, um, especially also when you look with tangential light. And then we can see Giannotti crusty-like dermatitis, which is sometimes called a papular id reaction. Um, and we also see molluscum in the setting of immunodeficiencies, both iatrogenic and congenital. And one of the ones that was described recently in one of our meetings was the X-Men syndrome of X-linked uh, uh, magnesium defect, um, uh, EBV infections, and neoplasia. So we talked about milial lesions in the head and neck in children. Very, uh, they can mimic acne and perioral dermatitis. They're very contagious to parents and siblings. And if somebody, a uh, kid has those, and they nuzzle into their mom like this child in the picture, uh, they can give that mom molluscum on her chin. And I have seen molluscum on the chin and neck in, in moms. Um, it isn't frequent, but it can occur. Uh, and so, and then we see that giant intraterogenous uh, type. Um, you know, beginning of the end, the boat sign that was described by Elaine Siegfried, so B-O-T-E, beginning of the end, uh, is a really um, nice thing to talk to parents about. And it's something that comes up clinically um, when we talk about um, some of the uh, in, in new agents that are coming out. Um, but the beginning of the end is a nice way to tell parents that, you know, their child is suffering, but it's the beginning of the end. The, there is an end in sight and the molluscum will be gone soon. Unfortunately, that end isn't as close as you'd wish. It can take many months for that to come to a close, even when we see the beginning of the end. Um, beginning of the end sign can mimic impetigo, and there really isn't a great way to distinguish them. And you have to think about giving topical antibacterials in these settings, sometimes oral, um, if it really looks infected. Um, so there's a nice series that came out of Israel uh, that was published in Pediatric Dermatology, looking at uh, 56 cases of kids um, who, who were um, cultured, uh, and seven had positive culture, so it's only 12.5%. 
um, in the setting of looking infected, that beginning of the end um, appearance with swelling and redness. Um, but what they have to say is that, um, you know, 55% had sterile uh, cultures or commensals, but some of these kids had fever, kind of goes along with the amount of kids who had a positive culture. Mean age was 4.6 years, but they had really no clinical indicators that could easily differentiate these two. And we offer are in that setting um, where we see kids like this and we, we are left um, treating and certainly culture is reasonable, but if a child's running fever, we, we were forced into treating for super infection. So super infection with bacteria does occur in the setting of molluscum. Uh, and some of the other features are erythema multiforme like uh, molluscum dermatitis. Here we see some molluscum centrally. I think it, um, we can kind of see this here, 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 here. These are the molluscum. And here's the dermatitis surrounding, but it gives that kind of three zones, you know, one zone clearance and then that zone again. So um, we get that erythema multiforme like look. And some of these kids actually end up hospitalized and, or in the ER and, and they want to put them in the hospital. They're, the kids look well, but, you know, they have this crazy looking rash. Um, Giannotti crusty like molluscum dermatitis again, uh, these monomorphic papules over the extensor extremities that really lo uh, strong location here, right at the, uh, uh, at the uh, forearm and the junction of the elbow. Um, and you see the same at, on the knees. Um, molluscum has uh, virulence factors uh, that help it uh, evade immune response. And it's part of why these infections last so long. Um, so proteins products that it produces can help it evade the immune system. MC005 and MC132 inhibit NF-kappa-beta. MC159, MC160, and MC163 reduces apoptosis. And then we have MC53 and MC54 that neutralize interleukin 18, preventing interferon gamma production. Uh, and, and all of these are really important because, you know, uh, ultimately, um, when I, I always mention in this MC005 and MC132 that inhibit NF kappa beta, one of the real issues, you know, we saw in uh, clinical trials with tacrolimus topically years ago was a signal that it might have caused some increase in molluscum. And, um, you know, it, here's where we can see that that NF kappa beta link to tacrolimus topically, why we might not want to give topical tacrolimus from molluscum dermatitis. So you, you, see, you get to see here that nice uh, clinical correlation with the basic science. Uh, symptomatology, 14% um, of kids describe pruritus. And in our practices, it's higher because we're seeing atopics heavily, but you know, it's, it's, it's about 14%, for another 14% talk about inflammation. Um, we can see up to 60% of kids will get dermatitis depending on the, on the study we look at. Uh, there's impetigo, super infection, um, are, are really a uh, concern, and that can be 3 to 29% of patients. That rare conjunctivitis, and, you know, there are kids who are actually in pain, and that pain can also be psychological. We can sometimes see children really unhappy about how, how they look, uh, and, and that's just something that um, we have to keep in mind. So what's the peak age of molluscum? So the average is about 4.5 years of age. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it depends on the study you look at. So um, some of the studies really look at when children end up in the office and some studies look at when the children get diagnosed. And that can be up to a year apart. So it's someplace, you know, a year uh, before and, or a year after, after this number potentially. So peak age of, uh, uh, in association with AP and Molasco, we certainly see a lot of kids with AP. Um, and we're seeing, uh, depending on the study and the location, in my practice, um, when I reported cases, it was like 60% of kids had a mosquito with hepatitis. Um, you have here the Berger study, also out of New York, about half of the kids are, are having uh, dermatitis. Um, and um, 
it's a little bit lower here in Chicago uh, in these uh, San Diego group, and a, again, a little higher in Baltimore, which talks to, says, speaks a lot about some of these inner city locations practicing. We, we think about exposures. Um, we also have to talk about family members. So the, again, the Baltimore study talked about 10%. Um, in my practice, um, you know, it was as high as like 40% of kids had these family exposures. Uh, and um, uh, some of the uh, studies in Chicago were almost 40% as well. And I think ultimately it varies from site to site, but, sometime, uh, but, but it is something that we have to think about um, in, in our practices about talking about COVID thing as a risk factor. Uh, and usually it's too late. <laughs> it's already COVID everybody and it's too late. But, um, and then there's this issue of scabies. And that came up, came up in this Native American cohort um, that's been described. And one of the things I can honestly say about uh, the Native American cohort is that um, we are, um, we're looking at disparity when we look at Native American patients. So you see that really high rate of atopic dermatitis, but you're also seeing pretty high rates of hypochigo and high rates of scabies, right? We're looking at over around a 10% rate of scabies. And that reflects um, something that we see also in Aboriginal patients in, uh, in Australia, that, that our Indigenous populations have a lot of disparity and they experience more infections um, because of things like lack of running water, um, crowding, and lack of resources. So just something to think about in your practices. So one thing I will point out here is that um, atopic dermatitis in uh, molluscum can both be triggered as a flare, but again, it can also be triggered as new onset. Uh, and I've reported in my practice um, that you know about 20% of kids were having AD flaring and about 10% of kids had new onset AD at the time of molluscum onset. So just like other infections have been thought to potentially trigger things like malassezia, uh, colonization, perhaps are thought to trigger atopic dermatitis, so too can molluscum. Molluscum is really common in younger kids. Um, so here's a nice study looking at this, these ages um, and um, you know, for Japanese first graders, Japanese sixth graders, uh, but in Native American kids, we're seeing pretty young kids. Uh, and um, you know, it's something we just have to think about um, as, being, uh, as being an issue. So it's the molluscum isn't just school-aged children, it's small children as well. Molluscum atopic dermatitis is itchy. So again, we can't say it enough. Molluscum can trigger more atopic dermatitis flaring. Molluscum can trigger new onset atopic dermatitis. Kids with atopic dermatitis have more molluscum lesions. Why? Because they scratch. They scratch and they move it around. Um, and uh, they also have more dermatitis. So that goes, these two things go hand in hand. Bluscum, again, can trigger not just the AD, but the, uh, the id reactions. And it triggers dermatitis in people who don't have atopic dermatitis. So it's triggering also an inflammatory reaction, even in kids who aren't necessarily prone to atopic dermatitis. It's that persistence that defines atopic dermatitis. Remember, atopic dermatitis is uh, something that recurs. So it's not just this episode during Bluscum. So 30% of kids less than six months uh, of age have, uh, have molluscum antibodies, uh, and that's usually maternal transfer. So, so women do transfer some immunity, but they can also transfer infection. So if a mother acquired disease and she didn't have time to produce antibodies, it can be transmitted vertically. And we've had this, this uh, described, it's not super common, um, but I, you know, I reported a case series with um, uh, the late, late great Arnold Duranji um, a few years ago. And, um, you know, it is something to keep in mind that it can uh, be, it, it's often seen on the vertex because of the transmission uh, from an infected womb uh, and uh, through the birthing connection. So you're looking at an infected cervix and, and, and through the uh, exit pathway of that, of that head. Uh, and that's where they get infected. So horizontal transmission, we talked about that, uh, but we also have to think about common infection in teenagers. 
Uh, so it's also seen as uh, in the groin, including genitalia, buttocks, lower abdomen, and inner thighs. And we have to think in those teen in the teenagers about screening for other STDs because it it can be transmitted even if you're wearing a condom, but it may also be a marker of individuals who aren't necessarily practicing safe sex. So we have to be a little careful with that. Uh, and it has certainly been uh, steadily um, increasing since smallpox vaccination ended. Uh, and it has been thought to be a mechanism of why the disease has become more common, the fact that we no longer um, get, get uh, pox virus vaccinations. Again, the natural history was described in this beautiful Baltimore cohort. Um, so about 50% of kids are clear at 12 months of age. And we say about 70% at 18 months of age. And I quote people, 70% are clear at a year and a half. Um, we don't really know what happens to that other 30%. Some of them linger and we have people who go up to four years and some of our immunosuppressed patients can be kind of indefinite. Again, the natural history uh, is in certain trials has been shorter. So uh, in the Burka trial, they offered uh, topical steroid therapy. They had a little faster clearance and a fewer lesions when uh, they offered topical steroid therapy. Um, and they had a quicker clearance as opposed to the uh, Brown study. Uh, in that trial, it was more like two years to clearance. Um, and again, this has to do with the time to get in to, uh, to your office. So if it took long to get into your office, they're going to be a little closer to um, clearance. Molluscum can cause a poor quality of life. It has been reported that molluscum can cause it, children um, to have a uh, low uh, CDLQI, uh, so a high LCDLQI score, so poor quality of life. Um, and, and it can be kind of medically disfiguring. It's also sort of, of parental anxiety. 82% uh, of parents uh, reported that molluscum concerned them greatly, moderately or greatly. Um, and that gives them a lot of stress. So I think, you know, one of our, our issues in, is um, that many of the pediatricians are sending kids uh, home um, with no therapy and they're saying to the parents, well, you know, it's gonna clear, but they don't mention to them, it's gonna take two to three years. And, and so the parents sort of figure it's gonna clear like a cold in two weeks uh, and two weeks later, it's not gone and it's spreading. And, and so all of these issues have to be dealt with and we have to really counsel parents appropriately. Um, there is a stress also of many therapeutic sessions uh, there's an uh, a stress if kids are excluded from pools and uh, sports activities. Uh, some of our wrestlers may be excluded, although I think they should be, but they're not sometimes. Um, and of course, it can be, uh, you can't get it through a gladiatory mechanism. Um, and it can cause self-consciousness and embarrassment. And there have been descriptions in the literature of suicidality in, in school-aged children because of their molluscum and the disfigurement. So we have to be able to offer therapy for molluscum. It's not, it is the case that many kids are uncomfortable. It can spread pretty extensively. Um, and um, many of the parents are fearful that it will spread all over the household. There's, there's reports constantly of exclusion from activities, from social events. Uh, I've had patients recently who were excluded from family events because they have uh, the risk of contagion. Um, so we have to think about offering therapy to help people um, be able to cope with years of this disease. Um, so, you know, some of the older therapies we talked about were curatage, um, which required topical lidocaine uh, and, and um, caused a lot of um, pain. Um, you know, one of the things I always notice with curatage is uh, it bleeds like stink. Uh, and if it's if you have lesions that are fairly close to the head and neck, um, even in the upper chest, sometimes the kids can hear the scraping and the scraping can be an irritating or frightening sound to them. So it's something to think about. Um, there's also potential for scarring, particularly in some of our darker skin patients. Um, you know, we may see temporary scarring for years or prolonged scarring. Uh, so we also think about cryotherapy, widely available. Um, it's been, you know, pushed for many years as a treatment, um, but there's a lot of pain, potential discoloration, particularly in type five and six skin kids, but even in kids who are of other skin tones. Um, and then topical retinoids have been described, but they're of low efficacy. They're easy to access. Um, 
you know, irritation is likely, especially in a topic uh, some that's usually disabling. Uh, there's certainly, you know, there are things that we describe, um, you know, like uh, tape stripping and, and other techniques. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, we, we have ineffective treatments previously. We've had, um, you know, things like omiquimod that were described. Uh, and I did a, 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 um, a, a placebo controlled um, trial of omiquimod. It was marginally effective with a single packet a day, but then it was tried on a larger scale by the company. Uh, and they offered kids up to two to three packets a day, and they found changes in the CBC. So it's con very concerning from the safety standpoint um, and, and not something that we want people to use in a widespread fashion. So, you know, majority of kids are young. Painless, well-tolerated options are needed. Of course, you know, I, I've described and I love uh, usage of cantharidin. Um, and I think that um, some of these other treatments that are coming out now are very exciting. You know, th things that are painless, um, that are effective. Uh, and so um, I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Bita to discuss those new options. Well, again, I wanna thank Dr. Silverberg for a great talk. She presented that at the Academy in a session that I held and she assisted with, so many thanks. And I'll go ahead, I'm gonna just discuss molluscum therapy. I know Dr. Silverberg touched on some of this, but I just wanna go a bit further. Um, I have done research uh, with all the grant funds paid to the medical school, I wanna disclose that. And I've also listed my disclosures where I did receive the honorarium. So let's talk about the history of molluscum. Um, this was first described back in 1817. So this was Bateman who was responsible for that publication. Then Patterson, which we all know from our Durham path, demonstrated the infectious nature in 1841 and somebody named Julius Berg provided, proved the viral nature in 1905. So we've talked about molluscum and its commonality. Dr. Silverberg has, has put this together for us very effectively. Um, we know it's about 1% of all skin disorders that are diagnosed. It does occur throughout the world. Uh, Dr. Silverberg has alluded to the fact that the um, it's more prevalent in top, tropical areas. Uh, and then we can see it in kids uh, in all ages, even after birth, but it, it is more rare if they're less than one year of age. And she alluded to the commonality of the skin condition in if they are, um, sorry, uh, in, in um, children with close contact. We talked about swimming pools, so I'll let that, uh, construct stay. Um, there's about a million cases diagnosed a year. So this is a common problem. I mean, we all see it in pediatric dermatology. We know that about only 15% come in for uh, medical care. Uh, we don't know if they just treat it at home or they don't have resources to go to medical care, but we know that the, the result of not getting care is that these lesions continue to spread. And we certainly see molluscum almost daily in our clinic. We know that it's a common problem. And Dr. Silverberg alluded to the most common age groups being the two to five-year-old group. She talked about the auto inoculation, the, the fomites, the co-bathing, the direct contract, childbirth. Um, we also know about the atopic dermatitis, the lack of treatment and the sibling to sibling transmission. And we know that 42% of all patients spread the virus to a sibling. So we have to be aware of these factors when we talk about treatment. So we know that the uh, most common place that patients may start is they stop by their pediatrician's office. And it's interesting, in a survey that was done, the most common prescription given by pediatricians is actually mupirocin. Dr. Silburn outlined for us that not all these patients actually have a bacterial infection, and probably many of them don't need mupirocin, but the inflammation, particularly the botson, can be interpreted as the lesion being infected and thus mupirocin is given. I do want to remind you that mupirocin has not been studied in clinical trials to treat molluscum, and I personally doubt it will have great efficacy. But do be aware that, as Dr. Silberg alluded, these can become secondarily infected. We know about the impact of these lesions on children. I think sometimes it actually is more stressful for the parents. And again, these children often do not get invited to the sleepover, swimming parties, or other events that they probably very much enjoy. So as Dr. Silverberg has covered a lot of this, I'm just gonna leave this uh, 
touched on very briefly. We know that the incubation period can be from two weeks to six months. We often ask the kids, did you go swimming in the summer? I work in Houston. It's very hot here. Swimming is a very common uh, thing that children will do, and many of them have gone swimming. So we often try to uh, think about that as possible way that they might have caught it from a sibling or maybe a cousin, somebody spending the night, all those things. Um, and meloscum, as Dr. Silverberg alluded to, can last up to four years if it's never treated. So keep that in mind. We talked also about the kids with eczema having, of course, a defective barrier, which renders them much more likely to develop uh, the meloscum lesions and wart lesions and other viruses as well. So keep in that. Keep that in mind. The comorbidity meloscum in eczema patients is up to 80%. So again, broken barrier, perfect segue of that meloscum virus into the skin of a patient with atopic dermatitis. And if you think about evolution, why do patients have their meloscum lesions make their own dermatitis? Well, think about the best way to get into the skin is to break the skin barrier. So in evolution, those meloscum that were smart enough to invoke an eczema response, they were the ones that spread, they were the ones that proliferated. So it makes a lot of sense if you think about it simply as an evolutionary uh, phenomenon. And that's what I tell my parents. Um, again, Dr. Silverberg has talked about the different types of meloscum. Uh, we haven't really studied this a great deal in terms of targeted therapy, but it is interesting that the common form is MC1 and the kind seen in patients with HIV is MCV2. We also see different forms in Australia and Asia, so be aware of that. And then epidemics can really occur, and you can have a lot of patients with meloscum in a very short time. We know that we can see widespread lesions, we can see persistent lesions, and we can see particularly resistant treatment to treatment lesions in those that are HIV positive who have low CD4 counts. And yes, we do see people with those low counts, even in this age with very vibrant available therapies for HIV infection. Dr. Silverberg alluded to the birth canal transmitting this vertically. So keep, keep in mind those lesions and a circular pattern on the scalp may indeed be meloscum. We have a number of reviews in the literature. I wanna make you aware of these because these are so comprehensive and helpful. There was a review on perspectives, etiology, diagnosis and treatment from 2019. There was also a recent article uh, for therapeutic approaches and special considerations in drugs and dermatology in 2021. We also have a consensus, uh, which this was really a great article that's the most recent article appeared in February of this year, looking at the evasion of immune surveillance. And Dr. Silverberg touched on this. And it's such an important construct because why are these lesions so doggone hard to manage? And really, as we know the, um, the ability to evade immune discovery, we really do have a challenge on our hands to make these lesions more readily available to the immune surveillance system such that the body can take care of these. So the risk of transmission is high. We talked about scratching, making it worse. We know bathing makes it more spreadable as does sleeping together. Here we have our beautiful histopathology of a molluscum lesion and every derm resident as early as the first year can recognize the Henderson-Patterson bodies, which are so characteristic of this condition. The CDC on its website actually talks about recommendations uh, regarding swimming pools. It does say kids can go swimming. We think it may be transmitted at the swimming pool, but I don't think it's a good reason to necessarily keep these children out of their swimming lessons or their background pool or their neighborhood pool because they're probably gonna get it from somebody else. And again, in Houston, it's very hot. So we need these kids to be able to swim and we need kids to learn to swim because drowning is still such a major cause of death during childhood. We don't want that to happen. Dr. Silverberg has alluded to transmission. She's talked about equipment. She's talked about pools. She's talked about fomites. So I'm gonna let that uh, rest. Uh, we don't have a perfect treatment at this time available to us. Uh, we know that surrounding areas are typically infected and it's subclinical because when the patient comes back and they think we've missed a few, it's actually new lesions emerging from those areas. We also know that recurrences are very common, especially if we haven't treated perhaps the causative case that brought it into the household in the first place. Some of the treatment areas are large. Certainly if I'm using cantheridin, I only treat about 10 to 15 lesions and I try to not do it in the thinner skin or in areas where the child might bend the knee or bend the arm, 
because those areas will tend to get more tender. I also try, if I can, to not treat the face just because the blisters that result can be unpleasant and unsightly. So we certainly don't want the treatment to be worse than the disease. We do know that cantheridin, as Dr. Silverberg alluded, is still a common treatment modality for all of us in pediatric dermatology. We do see blistering. I tell the patients that and the parents that that's exactly what they're there in clinic for me to induce because the blister is what helps the immune system recognize the virus. We know that there can be some sequelae in terms of using cantheridin, some discomfort, some pain. Uh, they can have discoloration, particularly in skin of color patients. And this is because of the ves vesicle mode of action. Um, but we don't have a lot of really high-powered clinical studies on the use of cantheridin previously. Uh, I'll update you on some of that in the future. Currently, we don't have a single FDA-approved product for molluscum. We know that that's hopefully going to change in the next few years. Back in 1962, the only way that we could get the cantheridin, the way we get it in our clinic, is by getting a compounding pharmacy to prepare it for us. We are not in a hospital-based clinic, so we can use this. We don't really have a straight algorithm for using cantheridin. Uh, we use a dry end of a Q-tip, and we found that's very effective. We will touch on VP102 solution, which is a standardized 0.7% cantheridin in slides that follow. I love to quote Dr. Silverberg because she has a great article in Cutis talking about the medical reasons to treat molluscum, and I think these are many. I think between the child getting bullied, the child's concern, the parent's concern, the discomfort spread, all these reasons are certainly warranted. Um, here's an article that I cited just a while ago. I do want to remind you that we have these available in the literature. And Dr. Silverberg provided this wonderful uh, overview of possible therapies. And of course, we know when we have many therapies, we don't really have a cure. And I think this exposes us to the real challenge in managing these molluscum lesions very effectively. Um, Dr. Silverberg also alluded to some of the treatments, including curatage. I tend not to do that in my clinic unless it's specifically asked for because it's always unsettling. Uh, we have parents and sometimes children who faint if they see their own blood, and we like to avoid that. And we find it's probably not well tolerated, even with a uh, good numbing cream put on before. And it also takes a lot of time, and we have to hold the child down, so it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort and resources to conduct this in small children. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the topicals. I'll allude to some that haven't been touched on. KOH has been used in some studies. I haven't found that it works that well for me, and so I avoid it. Uh, salicylic acid uh, can be effective. The others have all been mentioned, but we are going to talk about bendazem or sodium in some slides that follow. So what are the two pending medications to treat molluscum? We have VP102, which I touched on. It's a product by Verica, Berdazimer gel, 10.3% by Novan, and I'll discuss these in some detail. Let's first talk about nitric oxide. I do want to remind you that nitric oxide uh, won the Nobel Prize, but for cardiovascular uh, studies, and those that, that Nobel Prize was actually won by Murad, uh, Farid Murad, who is at our institution uh, quite a number of years ago, but the work he actually did was done in Virginia. But we're not going to talk about the cardiovascular aspects today, but talk about how this could impact favorably the treatment of molluscum. Why does this agent work? It is an antimicrobial, and it has immunomodulatory properties. So I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism of action and talk about some of the safety data from the clinical trials. We know that uh, nitric oxide was rec recognized by science as a breakthrough of the year in 1992. I talked about Dr. Murad's Nobel Prize in Medicine for Cardiovascular Disease in 1998. There have been lots of peer-reviewed manuscripts that deal with this. Again, it's antibacterial, it's antifungal, and it's antiviral. We know that it reduces key inflammatory mediators, including cytokines and chemokines. It does inhibit T cell proliferation and it modulates the apoptosis of key immune cells. So it's part of the natural immune response against microbial pathogens, and thus it really serves also as a key regulator of inflammation. So we know that nitric oxide works on the blood vessels and vascular tone. We're going to focus on the immune modulation because it really does have the potential to favorably affect many of the things we manage in atopic dermatitis. 
We know that nitric oxide is not necessarily considered a stable molecule. So the challenge was to develop a product where we they have the proper release and the safe release of nitric oxide such that patients could benefit from it and it would stay within the um, correct uh, web uh, webbing, if you will, of the property I'm going to discuss next. And we know that this is a new chemical entity. It was developed with a time-released uh, capability in the vehicle. This would allow us to really use this product in a very safe and effective manner. It also has a good pH-controlled hydrolysis that allows the release of the nitric oxide. And it's a very nice balanced product that uh, with good aesthetics. So we'll touch on that again. Uh, it is a nitrosyl platform that's part of the uh, the solution that it's mixed in. So I want to, to um, make you aware of that. Over 4,000 patients have been treated with this, this particular product in clinical trials. Uh, and because we know 6 million Americans suffer from molluscum each year, it certainly is apropos to try to get a product that would allow us to give safe and effective treatment within the clinic. Uh, and that's what I'm going to discuss. Now, we know that the duration of the lesions can be long, and we know that auto incubation can play a key role. So ideally, we do want to find a favorable way to manage these in the clinic, and particularly those of you who practiced in hospitals where you can't use non-FDA approved products. This really will allow, allow potentially a platform to, for successful management. We know that the molluscum lesions actually replicate within the cytoplasm of the cell, as Dr. Silverberg mentioned the replication is really limited to the human epidermis. The virus does enhance cell mitosis and it disrupts the epidermal cell differentiation. So again, in evolution, those molluscum lesions that provoked dermatitis could replicate and survive. And they're the ones that we're confronting today. We know that there is this immunoevasion because it can produce proteins that actually inhibit the host response to this infection. And that's key to recognize. And these viral proteins, as Dr. Silverberg alluded to, are MC160, 159, and MC54. And these actually prevent immune surveillance as well as apoptosis. So we'll look at these in a little bit different light and see that the nuclear factor of kappa beta is inhibited by these proteins. This is really a key component that we need to understand going forward because these are the arenas in which immune surveillance as well as apoptosis are diminished. So we can see that we have no effective um, products in the pipeline for a very long time. So it is time for us to get some brand new arenas with FDA approval on the market so that we can manage patients with molluscum. Let's talk a little bit about bradazomir sodium. Again, here is the structure. You can see how the proton donor um, capability of this particular structure allows this macromolecule and this pylosilaxone backbone to covalently bind this nitric oxide, and then it is released uh, from the macromolecule. So in the clinical trials, and what you can expect is there will be a little plastic sheet. You'll put the bedazomer gel on this little strip, as indicated. You'll add the hydrogel. You'll mix it up, and you'll apply this to the patient's skin. This is not complex. Our patients and parents were able to take this home with them. It was very easy to educate the parent regarding and have them use. What did we find from uh, one of the in vitro studies? We found that there was inhibition of HPV-18 viral replication after six days, after just a one hour topical treatment with this gel, which was very excited, exciting. And there was also successful rabbit model studies, which showed that, showed that there was reduction of both wild type and E8 mutation papilloma growth. So very, very good. So what does Berdazomer do? gel do? Well, of course, we have this modulation of MF kappa beta, which is really nice, and the activation in turn of the immune surveillance as well as apoptosis. So this is very, very nice. And we know if we modify with this S nitrosylation, of a, as I've illustrated for you here, we again bring back immune surveillance and we bring back apoptosis. And that's exactly what we need to do because these inhibitory proteins that are on the left side of the slide actually prevented those actions from moving forward. So again, what is S-nitrosylation? Well, here we see that the nitric oxide actually binds to a sulfur group on a protein, and then this action can modify various proteins 
both in cell signaling and the conformational change of key proteins in cell death, cell survival, as well as viral inhibition. We'll touch on our publication related to uh, the Be Simple 4 clinical trial. Uh, it was an add-on trial because we didn't have um, all of our first two pivotal trials reach uh, complete success in reaching the primary endpoint. So this study was added. It was a very large study. And here we had a very good outcome. Male and female patients were enrolled. They had to have three to 70 lesions at baseline. And we did study both primary endpoints as well as safety measures through week 24. Uh, we had a large enrollment both on the vehicle gel as well as on the active portion of the study. And what we saw in this particular trial was with, we had a large portion of the patients complete, 377 in the Bradasma group and 377 in the vehicle group. This is amazing to have that many patients stay in the study. Pretty even distribution of male and female. Uh, we did have mostly uh, Caucasian patients as occurs in so many of the clinical trials we participate in. We did look at the bots, uh, sign in this particular trial, which is what we didn't do in the first two trials, but I do want to make you aware of that. So again, this was published in JAMA Dermatology, a very great paper. Looking at efficacy, you could see that there was a superior response in the orange bar graphs for bedazma gel at week uh, 12, but notice that there was statistical significance noted as early as week two. We also saw at some of our secondary endpoints, there was better clearance if the patients were randomized to Burdazima as compared to the randomization to, on, to the uh, vehicle gel. And over 90% clearance, again, out, out performance in terms of Burdazima compared to the vehicle gel with statistical significance. We did also see a greater drop in lesion count if they were randomized to Burdazima gel as illustrated in this uh, particular slide. So again, looking at uh, the publication in JAMA Dermatology, we just want you to be aware of this. Adverse events and of transient nature were actually very mild for the most part. Some were just a little bit of irritation, application site pain, and some dermatitis did develop in the bedazimer group. Uh, there was some erythema, some pruritus, some exfoliation and dermatitis seen, and there was application site scar. That included those little dells that occur post molluscum. Be aware of that. It wasn't necessarily a true and persistent scar. So looking at the erythema by weeks, uh, it did diminish over time, and that was good. The same is true um, of other some of the side effects. So going forward, these were some of the patients in the first two pivotal trials that participated in my study site. This, um, although it may look red and itchy, it was actually very well tolerated. We certainly didn't see parents want to discontinue. They were very happy with the results. And they felt that indeed the drug worked because they saw the evidence based on this response. So be aware of that. There were some localized skin uh, reactions which can occur with any topical. We don't mean to trivialize that. But we want to make you aware. These are some of my patients from the clinical trial. Again, this usually did indicate that the patient was going to be a good responder. It was not considered an adverse event in all aspects because it did pretty much predict who was on the real product and who was going to get better. So again, large cohort of patients enrolled in this particular clinical trial. Uh, the primary efficacy and safety uh, landmarks occurred at 12 weeks. And while we don't know the exact mechanism of molluscum treatment with bradasma, we know that these patients did well and did stay in the study and were successfully treated. And this is just a follow-up. So you can see, again, very nice outcome, a little bit of decreased pigment, but that goes away. It's just a little bit of post-inflammatory change. So again, the B-Simple trial was very, very effective. I'll touch on briefly in the minutes that remain VP106. This is cantharidin. Uh, this comes in a small crayon-like plastic applicator. Uh, you can put it on in the clinic. Uh, it does have cantharidin as the active ingredient. Uh, it does have this little purple color, so you can see where you've already applied it. And they do have a, bliss, a, a bittering agent, so the child will not tend to want to put the lesions on the hands into the mouth. And again, you can see where you've applied it. Uh, this was also a multi-center trial. I did not participate in this particular trial, but they wanted to see how many patients got to clearance by day 84. Uh, they had to have a certain number of lesions in order to be eligible. Many of the patients did have previous treatments for atopic dermatitis. And as you know, many of the patients had atopic dermatitis. 
We did see complete clearance and more patients enrolled to the VP102 than the patients enrolled on the uh, vehicle of this particular drug. Now, we also saw quite a bit of change over time in terms of molluscum count. And I wanted to illustrate that again, the VP106 outperformed the vehicle virtually in all uh, recorded study uh, data at these various dates in this clinical trial. We did have some application site vesicles. That's not surprising because this is cantheridin. There was some pain pruritus, merithema, discoloration, dryness, edema, and erosion. Uh, but again, we're not surprised if we're using a cantheridin based product. We did see some vesicles. I want to mention that. Uh, low discontinuation rate, even if they were on the VP102 portion of this clinical trial. We did see good clearance of the lesions in the course of this trial, which was 84 days. Again, VP106 outperforming the vehicle and better 90% clearance if they were on the true product as opposed to the vehicle alone. We know that we can have auto infection, we can have reinfection. We've talked about these, so I'm going to go on. Uh, most patients have 10 to 30 lesions. I'll just mention that. We've talked about the impact on the social aspects of the child's life. I believe there is good reason to treat molluscum. I know when parents come with their children to my clinic, they do want treatment. They don't want to be told, let's just watch it. They've already heard that from their primary care physician, and they are here for treatment. So try to limit spread as best you can. Try not to get um, the patients bathing together. I think they can go swimming. I think it's hard to prevent the kids from taking those lessons. So we do encourage those things. Um, we do we do believe some lesions can scar. Dr. Silverberg touched on that. There's a lot of parental psychological uh, stress, the discoloration of the skin. And of course, we don't want these lesions to get secondarily infection. Um, I think that I'll go ahead and stop here because we do want to leave a minute or two for questions. Um, I hope this interface with uh, Dr. Silverberg and myself this evening have been helpful to you both in the understanding of molluscum and also in the potential future therapies which may become available once they receive FDA approval. So thank you for your time and attention. And if Jen, you'd guide us through the possible questions that have popped up. Yes. Thank you both so much. Um, these talks were extremely informative and I appreciate you both very much. Uh, first question, with the association of molluscum being transmitted horizontally as an STI, should providers be concerned about potential child abuse when it is present in the groin region in those who are very young? Dr. Silverberg, I'll go to you first. I think that, uh, you know, the, the uh, interesting thing about molluscum is if you really look at most kids, you'll see a, um, uh, you will see a trail of uh, where it came from. You know, if you, if you ask, it's usually a sibling, you know, there, there's a setting where it was acquired, um, daycare, um, a child care. So there's often a trail. Um, we don't generally think about it that way because we often see molluscum in other parts of the body as well. So um, it, it, it often is not the case. Uh, it, it's more likely not the case. It's unlike warts in that respect. Warts, you know, we have to think about it a little more aggressively, but particularly in smaller kids, there, there often is a, 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 um, a reason for transmission, a sibling, a, co a cousin, a, a pool party, uh, <laughs> something that went on. And it, if you really look, you can often tease that out. And I think it helps us um, it helps us to know that transmission modal, the transmission modalities, um, because it helps us identify a source. If you're treating five kids in a family, but yeah, I mean, it has to be in your mindset always when you see uh, extensive lesions in the groin area. If I saw lesions around the anal area, I don't think we see lesions around the anal area normally. Uh, we don't see that, you know, very vaginal lesions in small kids. We see them on the buttocks them on the inner thighs. We see them on skin surfaces, but we don't really expect to see them on um, vaginal, mucosal, or perianal skin. So in those two locations, if I would see them there, I'd have to give pause to that and, 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 look, and do investigation. But um, I, I don't, how do you feel about that, Mina? Yeah, I think, I think as pediderms, we're pretty sensitive to child abuse. I mean, I look at the the parent's reaction, I look at the child's reaction. I mean, I think it's almost a, it's an observational, but it's also a gut feeling. Are they really uncomfortable talking that? Do the parents get instantly defensive? 
I think we have to judge any child where we suspect child abuse, whether it's this or trauma. Um, we really have to just be thoughtful. But I agree with what Dr. Silverberg said. We don't see it quite that often in the very youngest children in regions that would make us be a little bit more suspect of child abuse. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what do you recommend in terms of when to wash off Confaridin? I have heard so many different strategies and recommendations. Uh, Dr. Hebert, we'll go to you first. Well, if I have a very fair skin child, I generally will limit it to one hour. So if I get to Fitzpatrick three, four, and five, I can generally go two hours. Now, I think it depends on what your compounded cantheridin contains. So I'm speaking to the compounded agent that I use in my clinic. You may have a different experience. But certainly if I get feedback that the child got big blisters, um, we might cut back the time, but I generally say two hours is my recommended max. Uh, occasionally, the parents forget and the blisters get big, and I hear about it, uh, but we do try to remind them to wash off in two hours, and I generally look at my watch and tell them what the time is. Oh, that's so true. That's exactly what I look at the time also. So, you know, I, I think that uh, it, it really, you're correct. It really totally depends on the uh, on the formulation you use. Some of them a little, um, and, and also if you just got a new bottle, probably not as intense as, you know, some of these old bottles where they dry out, uh, it's probably a little more concentrated. Um, I, I, I do also do the same. I say two hours for the smallest kids, and I, I say like four, you know, we can go in the original study that I did as a fellow where we called 300 parents, you know, it was like four hours, you know, wash off in four hours. Um, but the guidance that I've always given is a handout. And I think it's okay. It's important to give some guidance. And it says uh, to check every half hour for blistering uh, and then uh, wash at the first sign of blistering. But I agree with you. The smallest kids uh, and those like really light skinned little blonde kids with like transparent skin, I, I like to, I, I do also shorter contact times. I don't think you go wrong either way. I think what it really turns out is that you're really giving good skin care and you're moisturizing the area, so you're soothing the kids. Um, you know, I think uh, it's it's not necessarily, it doesn't uh, limit the efficacy um, if you do it a little bit sooner. You can always retreat. Um, it's not, there's no downside to that. Excellent, thank you. Does the number of lesions or other factors like stage in the progression affect preference of treatment? Oh, so first of all, I don't love to treat kids who've got inflammatory lesions on day one. I, I, I was trained as a fellow. <laughs> okay, that was my, my uh, Tony, Tony Mancini, Big Power said to me, you know, we treat inflammation first. We don't, we don't blister atopic dermatitis um, or dermatitis because it, ha it carries staph on it. So I, I go through the same. I, I tend to, I don't treat lesions that have, uh, they don't blister areas. Um, that have uh, a lot of dermatitis, I tend to do uh, recommend moisturizing, avoiding, um, avoiding rough sponges that spread it. Uh, I give the topical steroid medication for the dermatitis and good skin care. If they come in and they have a couple of lesions and they're not inflamed, I'm more than happy to treat on day one. Um, I, but I often do defer and I get the skin under control. But some of those inflammatory lesions, are the you know, if they have the boat sign, um, I think you can look at that Berger study and it'll tell, it talks about how, you know, giving topical steroids cleared a, uh, you know, a third of those what, uh, um, lesions. But it's worthwhile to just clear that group of lesions first, clear out the background inflammation and then treat. Um, but I believe that the, uh, the VP102 trials didn't necessarily remove dermatitis, but I do that in my practice. Nothing there, any comments? Yeah, I would say when they're in my clinic, I just go ahead and treat them. I might stay away from the really inflamed lesions. And again, I avoid, if I can avoid treating the face, I might leave the face alone and treat other areas. Again, not going where the creases are, particularly in the arms and legs, because it can be uncomfortable. But I think the parents come to see me, they want treatment. And we we might put a treat on, and I, probably I treat no more than 10 lesions at any time on any child. And again, avoiding the face if I can. Uh, I and, and sometimes I do have to treat secondary infection, but I'll just treat sure. that and the atopic dermatitis all. I just lay out the plan, but generally I treat on the day they show up. All right. Okay. And, and I guess there, are, I, I, I think I guess I'll, I'll mention it you know, for those really extensive lesions and atopics, like 
I have kids to come in. I count them with the kids. When you hit 50, I start to think about say Medellin early. <laughs> After, if I have to, if you, if the, if, if the combined uh, number of lesions exceeds the child's fingers and toes and my fingers and toes, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're doing that thing with I like that as a measurement. <laughs> um, just a few more questions here. Um, Angel Pagan says, thank you so much, Dr. Silverberg and Hubert. Uh, this question is for Dr. Hubert. Are you aware of any studies or do you think uh, the berdazimir gel may have applications, uses, or benefits for inflammatory skin diseases that don't share the viral etiology that eczema, psoriasis, et cetera, do? Well, wow. definitely I'm talking off label here. I mean, I think that Berdasmer has many potential uses and I know Novan, the company that's working in is um, probably gonna broaden some of the reach that they have within dermatology. Uh, but I think they wanna get this first drug on the market and then uh, they'll probably begin some research that will delve into uh, many of the arenas where we have unmet needs, particularly I've certainly shared with them some of my thoughts and I hope the listeners tonight, if they have ideas, they would reach out to Novan and share them as well. Uh, they may not work on that in the immediate weeks, but perhaps in the years to come, we will have the opportunity to, to develop those, uh, those uh, opportunities. Dr. Silverberg, any comments? Uh, no, I totally, I mean, I totally agree with that, but I, I, I think that, um, I think that Vita has, I, when you look at, at your talk, um, you know, one of the things that always strike uh, that, that really strikes me is that, um, there's just, just this tremendous unmet need in molluscum. Uh, and we spent a lot of time, you know, trying to get where we could, where we, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think, um, I'm very happy that there, there are, you know, I, you're, the science now behind molluscum and the science in your talk about the mechanisms of action and where these, um, wh where in it, this agent falls in, it's very, um, it, it's just really exciting to know that uh, molluscum has come, uh, is, is, is now like a, it's a real, <laughs> it's come of age, it's a real scientific issue. Yeah, it's really got some gas behind it now. And the two of you did a beautiful job of highlighting the unmet need and just how devastating this really is. Um, a couple more questions regarding uh, uh Should the location thickness of the, should the location or thickness of the epidermis be considered for the time of the cantharidin application? Well, I think certainly if I've got it on the face, I might leave it on a little shorter. Uh, if you're in the creases or any skin folds or thinner skin, uh, and again, I mentioned the very fair skin child, yes, that, that could impact both the amount that I apply and the duration that I allow the product to stay on the skin. And I think as, as a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Silverberg. Perfect. <laughs> as a follow-up to that, um, is 7% something that could go up to four hours? Um. I'm trying to, I didn't do that clinical trial, so I can't remember off the top of my head how long they left it on. Uh, but again, they did get some blistering, um, but again, overall very well tolerated. Uh, side effects that you would expect from a cantheridin product were uh, discerned during the clinical trial. But I think as pediatric dermatologists, all of us have had cantheridin use in our training and we would know how to manage those potential side effects. Stay. Um, okay, the questions keep rolling in. Thank you so much for staying on. We'll try and wrap this up here. Any advice for patients having severe inflammatory reactions to their molluscum, such as patients post chemotherapy or bone marrow transplant? That's a good question. Hmm. I guess, you know, I, I think that uh, ultimately um, we don't want to do harm. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's always like the, a child's general health is so vitally important. Um, I don't want to give, you know, I, 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 I can't remember the, you know, the last time I needed to give oral steroids for a, a severe molluscum id reaction or e even the EM reaction. I mean, most of that is really just a good topical steroid. Um, and I think good top, we, we're so adept in dermatology, uh, in pediatric dermatology, a good topical care and avoiding endemic agents you know, and not interfering with the general health of the child if we can. 
Um, I do think, you know, in those cases, sometimes we do end up, you know, requesting kit, to, really talking to the, uh, to the uh, you know, hematologist, can we give it, do you feel comfortable with my giving antihistamines, you know, looking into interactions, but, um, you know, good atopic care really goes a long way in those conditions, you know, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't really see negative experience, I usually see positive experience when they, they reconstitute, that they start to get clearance, not necessarily, I don't think, feel like id reactions are necessarily a bad thing, even if they look great. I don't know, how do you feel about that, Beta? Do you have a lot of experience with the cancer patients? Well, I think when you have a patient who's really immunocompromised, sometimes they have bigger battles to fight the molluscum, although I usually treat molluscum. Uh, if they're at the, in the throes of immunosuppression, I might not worry about the molluscum right then, just as Dr. Silverberg alluded, as their immune system comes back, they reconstitute, often the molluscum will be managed more effectively. But if the parent really wants something, and remember these parents have so little control, they're looking for something that they can treat. That mm -hmm. might be a time I would cure out one or two of them or a few more, put the numbing cream on, leave it on for a good while use some ice while I curette them. That way you're not interfering with the chemotherapy uh, protocol. You're not leaving an open wound, which could delay radiation therapy. Um, you know, the parent feels that you did something. And I think that might be a moment where I know I wouldn't interfere with anything else going on as long as I can create that small uh, scraped area and not, not be in a field where they would get radiation because that would have to heal first. That might be the approach I would take, or I might treat just a few molluscum again to to not cause any problems, not cause harm, and just uh, try to get that patient on the road to recovery. Yeah, that's actually I, I, it's a great point. It's one of those situations where I don't use immunotherapies a lot in people who are undergoing a lot of other treatments. I feel like uh, I don't want to mess with their immune system. When, when I know the hematologist, uh, oncologist has to get it just right. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, our final question, and I'm going to mispronounce this word, so hopefully the two of you can help me. Any experience with synecathestins or varigen? Saying that right? Oh, I, 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 uh, I had one patient, uh, The uh, somebody gave... Um, uh, ax 50 axillary and flank lesions. He went down the inner arm like this and the kid um, got a brisk response. He was bright red and swollen. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it was not good. Um, I, I said, so um, that was when it had first come out and it was sampled first to adult dermatologists and not to me. <laughs> um, and then I, I didn't really request samples after that. <laughs> I don't know what's your experience, Vita. <laughs> well, first, I don't think it's FDA approved in children. So that's right. the, that's right. the um, challenge. And then it has to be kept in the refrigerator. I don't really have any personal experience in children. I have used it in a couple of adults who had warts. And the real indication for that is warts. And I have had warts that I, I they just wouldn't go away. And I tried everything. And only when I used that particular product did I actually result in the involution of the wart. So I think it has a role to play, but maybe not in the molluscum arena. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. I want to especially thank Novan for bringing you to Pedra with this information. I, as I said before, you two beautifully highlighted the unmet need and all of the amazing work that's now being done in this particular area. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you all to our attendees for joining us this evening. Uh, we will make a recording available so that you can go back and revisit these talks. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you.